Thank you, Armin um, and Victoria over there um, for inviting us and also to the ARC Plus team and everyone, Mark and, and um, Beatrice for also being part of this. This is such a joy to be here. Um, yeah, so thank you um, uh, for this opportunity. In fact, actually the workshop was so so far, super so far. I'm, I'm so excited that also I want to say thank you to the students for giving me a ton of energy. I didn't even have to go home and take a nap or go to the hotel and take a nap, which I thought I would do. <laughs> Instead, I was just so revved up. I had to come, I could come straight. Um, I want to say one thing um, about the Bauhaus that I'm not planning on talking about in this, but I think at one point yesterday someone said, uh, at the Bauhaus, if only women and people of color had been part of the the planning or part of the institution. And I think one of the takeaways you might get from my book is that women were actually not people of color, unfortunately, though uh, Jews and, and people of other religious denominations. But nevertheless, women were foundational. That's, that's a story that has to be told and has to be understood. It's one that hasn't really received as much attention, though it started to in about the 1990s. Um, Magdalena Trosta before me, very important work. So I, I just want to acknowledge that the Bauhaus is not just white men. <laughs> so anyway, um, okay, so I'm gonna move on um, with my talk today. Um, I want to start, of course, as always, I think that this is the inevitable, the preface that is the apology. Um, so I'm not gonna be talking about the Bauhaus all that much today, actually. Um, so Bauhaus, it's a conceptual maybe framework. Um, I've done a lot of work in this area, as you now know, and it might be expected that I would be addressing or redressing this field once again, um, but it's only somewhat tangential to my current research, or rather I should say that in order to look at the Bauhaus again, if I am to do that, and I probably will in the future, and I keep on being asked to do so again and again, I first need to finish two projects. One is on the 19th century, which I'll talk about briefly in a moment, and one on the present which I'm beginning to tackle for this talk. So what I present here today deals quite a bit less than I had initially thought or initially proposed with the topic of Bauhaus trends, that is with Bauhaus as object and all of its objects, so I will mention a few, um, than with the concept and history of the trend in general. So as a problem for historical analysis, the trend as a problem for historical analysis and historical methodology. Hence the subtitle is Notes Toward a History and Theory of the Trend post-trend. The Bauhaus is perhaps the horizon of this talk, but not its proper subject. So I want first to provide um, this prologue, um, that is to mention the historical project out of which today's thoughts emerge. And so what I'll be presenting today is tethered to the present, or rather the just past, because I am a historian after all, I can't really talk about the present. But it must also be seen as part of this bigger narrative or set of issues, ones that I'm researching and writing about for this book manuscript that Armin just mentioned, titled Fashion After Capital, Frock Coats and Philosophy from Marx to Duchamp, uh, which deals a lot with the logic of trends and diagrams. And I'll be talking about the trends part for today. So this book seeks to examine the rapid entanglement of capital and fashion over the 19th century. In this moment, that is the 19th century, the terminology used to describe the logic of both fashion and finance came under the sway of diagrammatic and statistical thinking. In that century, fashion together with finance became subject to trends. To be a bit more specific, as the field of political economy develops in the wake of Adam Smith's late 18th century writings and also gains a mainstream foothold in England with the work of free trade advocates like John Ramsay McCullough, someone that most people don't know about unless you're like really in the weeds of political economy. Um, it is increasingly submitted to the mathematical models, numerical and on the one hand and then geometrical and diagrammatic on the other. So Ricardo's and Mill's labor theory of value is completely overturned under the influence of writers like um, uh, William Stanley Jevons and uh, someone, Fle Fleming Jenkins or something like that, who came up with this diagram in the 1860s and 70s. Political economy hence becomes economics. 
so, or what we now think of as the field of economics. So um, I'm going to poorly paraphrase an artist um, by the name of Richard Igby um, on this transformation. He's also studied a lot of political economy. So uh, by the end of the 19th century, the literary whodunit novel quality of political economy is replaced by uh, the, the kind of diagrammatic model of economics. Um, or as Margaret Chavez, a philosopher of economics, um, would put it, uh, economics once associated with the natural sciences, as there's a narrative to the natural sciences of which political economy was, was, the, was the story, is now fully denaturalized, rendered uh, theoretical as a mathematical formula. Meanwhile, in the realm of sartorial fashion, over this time period, cuts are increasingly schematized in patterns that are ever more precisely measured and mapped, no longer just bespoke or tailored. Uh, the gentleman's frock coat, for instance, is by the 1820s produced ready-made for soldiers and liveries alike with scientific yet flexible methods for measuring and cutting. And the butterick pattern, developed uh, circa 1860s and sold via mail order to lower class, middle, lower middle class housewives, deploys calculus to create a topological diagram that can be adapted um, or can adapt rather high fashion for the masses. Each dotted line transforms the cut into different sizes and shapes. In other words, during this period, dresses, coats, and political economy were all mathematized, described now through calculus, calculations, diagrams, charts, and graphs. Trends began to take off circa 1900. Okay, so that was my little prologue. Um, we get maybe now into the weeds a little bit. So the mathematical trend was furthered as economic data about fashion, consumer, and industrial trends were extrapolated and analyzed in newspapers for an audience of investors and would-be capitalists. So as political economy is developing as a field, so too a kind of lay version of economics is developing in newspapers, all of it kind of supported by diagrams and graphs. Um, Dow theory, alternatively called trend theory or technical analysis in economics, um, initially developed by founder and editor of the Wall Street Journal, Charles H. Dow, in the 1890s, came to be used to forecast the movement of markets, be they industrial or sartorial. Among the six basic tenets of his theory, Dow said trends in stocks could be determined by examining the fluctuations of railroad and shipping statistics. The point is that these trends, these two averages, should in a healthy economy or a bull market move in tandem. But when the performance of the averages diverge, it is a warning that change is in the air. The investor should be wary, or at least he should hedge his bets. Similarly, when Paul Nystrom, a totally unknown, I say relatively unknown, but totally unknown business marketing professor at the University of Pennsylvania published the economics of fashion in 1926. He mobilized the language of finance to discuss fashion trends and retail market cycles. He advocated the use of diagrams and the method of statistical analysis for retailers claiming these could better exploit and predict the desires or psychology of consumers. So rather than compare the trends of railroads with that of industrial goods, as Dow uh, had done, he instead compared the movement of stocks with hemlines. This is the hemline theory that I'm, some of you of the skirt, in this, according to this theory, is, uh, could, in the realm of fashion, um, have some kind of predictive pr uh, possibility for determining the future state of the economy, or at least to, to kind of determine where the economy was at that moment. Of course, Paul Nystrom <laughs> did not uh, uh, predict the crash that came just three years after the publication of his fashion, Economics of Fashion, so we might say that he was the first failed trend forecaster in the realm of fashion. Oh, you have a, okay. I didn't, I, sorry, this should have a title. So the future belongs to Bauhaus wallpaper cycle two. It should be there, but anyway. For sure, trend forecasting was becoming a thing in the 1920s, if not called quite that. As Nystrom explained of modern art, quote, in every period of time, 
certain styles become the fashions. Modern art, so-called, is not only a distinctive form of art expression that is a style, but it is also a growing fashion. It seems to be gaining ground very rapidly by application to all branches of applied and decorative arts. It has appeared in furniture, in interior decorations, in chinaware, in glass, in jewelry, in apparel. In other words, he probably was describing the Bauhaus, in kitchen utensils, etc. right? Um, so, in theatrical the scenery, even in architecture, modern art is an illustration of the major style becoming the fashion of our own day. And across the Atlantic, some German advertisements told viewers the future belongs to Bauhaus wallpaper. As a marketing ploy, a focus on the modern and the future was indeed in fashion. An example of the mode for progress, universal forms that could spread across walls, rendering its occupants homogenous, uniform dwellers, turned human users into what Helmut Lethen would later describe as cool subjects. Desirous, yes, but only insofar as that desire was sublimated in the intellectual rationalization of modern goods as necessary functional stuff. Still, as Mark Wigley, in, now in the audience here, um, has reminded us in his White Walls designer dresses and some other texts and assemblage, etc., fashion or anti-fashion was always part of the modernist architectural program. Uh, fashion uniform of the white wall, but this indeed was its sartorial program. And of the now, the present, but of the future. The Victorian era arts and crafts or Wiener Werkstätte trend for wallpaper had already given way to clean white painted walls at the Bauhaus building in Dessau. So in spite of the fact that this was ended up being the most profitable outcome of the Bauhaus, the tapeta, the wallpaper, in spite of that, it was also kind of like so not really on trend, right? Um, it was this kind of sort of reactionary like hold, well, someone, an architect, do you know, Baum architect would say so, but it was the most kind of popular. Anyway, in 1924-25, as was visible in the stairwell on the left, or this is a diagram of the, st or drawing of the stairwell on the left, um, done by um, Herbert Beyer um, in the workshop of Kandinsky, the wall painting workshop of Kandinsky, um, we have the colors, red, yellow, blue, but by 1926, this is the, f the image of inside the stairwell inside um, the Bauhaus in Dessau, we see the clean white painted walls. So this cool abstractness kind of takes over. Um, objects were now sharply lit to draw attention to their texture uh, and uh, da, 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 or the simplicity of their shapes, just as the trendy ideology of Sachlichkeit or functionalism was ramping up. The fashions shifted from red, yellow, blue to plain white or neutral grays and tans. So the Bauhaus workshop that created the tapeta, the, I guess, wallpaper workshop, but it was just subdivision of the uh, either the interior design workshop mm -hmm. or the um, printing workshop, um, tried to keep up uh, to follow and develop designs using the latest lines and subtle patterns, but it was futile. If the future belonged to Bauhaus wallpaper, it was only because it demonstrated the perennial slip into out outdatedness of styles, forms, and media. The Bauhaus masters probably felt the same way after they arrived to America. Ah, they thought, here's a new land to imprint. Instead, they realized they had already been quantified, measured, turned into a generic brand based on statistical trend data. Their success at the Museum of Modern Art and the like, in some sense, determined their fate. The fashion for modern art would inevitably go out of style. So trend forecasting became a thing in the 1920s, really spread rapidly um, in the realm of fashion style. Um, it came and went, uh, as you can see, according to this little trend chart, um, but typically trended upwards in the 1930s until like then you see like a crashing around the time of the war uh, and then going back up, of course, 1950s, 60s, yay, exuberance, 70s, 80s, 90s, and then it just kind of plateaus. 
So once again, trends are in fashion now, what, uh, bringing us back full circle to the present. Now, I am admittedly a bit late to the game, <laughs> but I think it's fair to say that a collective obsession with this temporally indicative noun come gerund began trending in about 2010, at least according to the reputable Google Trends site, a subdivision of the online search engine. 2010 is also when uh, the Google Trend platform began paying attention to things trending online and also show the fastest rising and fasting fa fastest falling uh, trends of the moment. So in this feedback loop, this Jeremcon noun, trending, gained new life in its gerund form. So in fact, Google began compiling and researching this data, uh, search data a bit earlier, already at the end of 2001, just three short years after the founding of the company, to collate the then billions of daily queries on their site. Now, I don't know, trillions, quadrillions, I'm not sure, for the use of potential advertisers and other people curious about the hottest trends like some quaint relic of the still new Web 2.0 universe in 2001, they called their year in review site Google Zeitgeist, even as they noted their own trendiness. So from Harry Potter to Osama bin Laden and Florida Supreme Court to Napster, this is my quoting from them, the Google year end Zeitgeist reveals the collective focus of the online mind, highlighting the main events that drew the attention of a global audience. Who would have thought that this is where battles in the future now would be staged, won, and lost? So this is a, a funny, right? Cambridge Analytica website access screen grab, and basically you can you find out what the company did, but it gives you information on who to go to to get your money back, <laughs> I suppose, to the lawyers that are overseeing the, you know, after bankruptcy or whatever. Um, and then Trump, just a couple days ago, accused Google of burying conservative news. Clearly, he's very aware of what the tr how the trend search data works, right? All right. I'm kidding, but anyway. So, coincidentally or not, in 2010, the method of trend spotting or futurology was also getting established in the realm of business consulting. By 2013, the online jobs networking site LinkedIn provided a list of the 10 hottest trend tracking companies, many of which had been founded at the turn of the decade. One such company, uh, co-founded by the trend forecasting oracle or guru Martin Raymond, even dubbed its approach futurology. This study of the future found its perfect form as a trend forecasting site, or rather this future laboratory, which provides companies with bespoke, that is perfectly tailored, research and recommendations. The collapse of fashion into capital and capital into fashion that first emerged in the 19th century is now mobilized as a model for consulting firms. Questions of business, numbers and management are no longer important. What is crucial is whether your company is ahead of the trends. But this, again, is already old news. In her January 2011 review of Martin Raymond's then just published The Trend Forecaster's Handbook of 2010, journalist Carolyn Enting described the book's gist. So this how-to book uh, is a teaching aid for students and academics keen to know more about trends, trend forecasting and consumer insight techniques. Raymond defines the trend forecaster as a lifestyle detective who detects patterns or shifts in attitudes, mindsets, or lifestyle options that run against current thinking or how people behave, live, dress, communicate, and trade. Recent lifestyle trends identified by the Future Laboratory include bleisure, mixing business with pleasure, ooh, and womenomics, cash-rich, mauve-collar workers. Most recently, experiential retail, citizen hackers, DIY culture, edutailing, and new normal consumer have been added to the trend forecasting vocabulary. Funny, <laughs> as Eating writes, paraphrasing Raymond, the future was already happening, has, sorry, the future has already happened, it just isn't very well distributed. And I would say, thankfully, this is or was the case. Anyway. I think that was a joke. So, what is a trend? What is a trend? 
So before we proceed, let us think a little bit more to kind of deeply about this concept and also try to sort out what this historical phenomenon is or was, right? how it came into existence. You could say this is a kind of genealogy, if you will. So I've now spent a bit of time researching the history or genealogy of the trend, and I realize once you start, it's an endless fucking rabbit hole in search of trends, the trend. Uh, there's really no definitive place. If someone has any suggestion, please help me. But anyway, I'll start with the OED. This is the OED online, which is a very different one than the one you get through the university. But anyway, this will start with this one. So trend as a noun, a general direction into which something is developing or changing, as in an upward trend in sales and profit margins. Two, a fashion, the latest trends in modern dance. Three, a topic that is the subject of many posts on a social media website or application within a short period of time. I think it's actually really funny because you have the first two definitions which are very much, con very much indices of the late 19th, early 20th century, and then the last one which is the index of post Facebook 2007, right? So it's like those definitions kind of have their own sort of historical lineage. But verb, which is actually the first definition of a trend, was to change or develop in a general direction. Unemployment has been trending upwards. Uh, and actually, this, the, fir the second one is the first one, uh, to bend or turn away in a specified direction. So it's funny how you go from the specific, it was a specific and it goes to the general direction. Um, and then the two um, of a topic to be subject of many posts in a social media website, da 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 da. Okay, so the verb to trend is by etymo etymological origin an indication of a specific div uh, direction caused by a turn or bend in a river. Seems harmless enough. But then, sometime in the late 19th century, this qualitative condition or process became a quantitative measurable example and was generalized into a noun. And Ted Porter's The Rise of Statistical Thinking, 1820 to 1900, we get some picture of the mentality that, starting with the Be Belgian mathematician Adolf Quetelet and then the, French, the British um, Francis Galton, sought to use new troves of data to determine the hidden truths about physics and society. They categorized this data into boxes of information, and so the concept of trend as noun takes off in usage, sometime circa 1900. At this point, data analysis pervades the fields of science, chemistry, and physics, and in, in particular um, social sciences then, and politics, and mapped and invented by the new field of statistics, the trend is quickly adapted to fashion and uh, finance. Joining these together then in an inextricable bond. So forecasting and fashion in other markets now entails the harnessing of data and probability theory to determine all manner of outcomes from actuarial rates to eugenics. Statistics create narratives of inevitability, of fluxes and flows, of rallies and crises. The cycles of, econo of economics and fashion denaturalized through economics, I'm sorry, through mathematics, are thus renaturalized as evolutionary developments of herd instinct or a mass mentality, or as the simple consequence of the laws of physics, what goes up must come down. Indeed, a big part of the trend for trends in the turn of the century Europe um, is a concern for a parallel movement in psychology. Statisticians saw psychology as the terrain from which and in which trends emerged most palpably. In his relatively late 1921 essay on mass psychology and the analysis of the I or the Ich, um, uh, Freud reviews Gustave Le Bon's and others' portrayals of the mass mind. Along with cities and crowds, psychological methods of research focused on tracking the motivations and behaviors of larger and larger groups of people. So the, human single, the single human subject, it seems to Freud, was no longer enough. Uh, and so Freud goes on to describe, at one point in this book, the difference between trends and history in his description of social masses of different formations. Masses of the short-lived kind, uh, e.g. revolutionary masses, form rapidly from individuals of different types as a result of transient interest. 
By contrast, there are the stable masses or social entities in which people spend their lives and that are embodied in the institutions of society. Masses of the first kind, i.e. the trends, sit on the back of the ladder, so to speak, as short but high waves ride the longer swell of the sea. Pushed by love and desire, not between individuals, but for leaders, groups, and ideas or ideologies, the masses coalesce like swarms in a uniform syncopated, syncopated ry rhythm. Freud might as well have been describing a Google trend chart. So a few years later, Walter Benjamin uh, discusses the overlap between fashion trends and stock market trends in the Arcades Project. So just as he identifies the correlation between photography and statistics, you might remember that line from the work of art essay, um, I note he doesn't use the word trend, tending instead to the more traditional fashion. Nevertheless, Benjamin does suggests, or Benjamin, I don't even know what to say anymore, suggests this phenomenon in his analysis of the communicative technique that pervade the realms of fashion and stocks. As he notes in the Arcades Project, these are indicated by semaphores, which you could define, uh, de is defined by Wikipedia as teleg telegraphy systems that convey information at a distance by means of visual signals with handheld flags, rods, discs, paddles. So repeated enough times to become statistically legible, the opening and closing of windows in the provinces, uh, Benjamin notes, indicates whether stocks have gone up or down in the Paris markets. He was citing a 1837 Gazette. That's the funny thing about the Arcades Project. Like, who's speaking? I don't really know here. But anyway, I think this is the person from the 1837 Gazette that um, Benjamin quotes in the convolute O on prostitution and gambling. And here, in the provinces, speculation on the stock exchange was dependent on getting news from Paris about the fluctuations in the exchange of the most important stocks. Special couriers and carrier pigeons had to serve this end. And one of the favorite methods in, a Fran in France, that in those days was dotted with windmills, was to transmit signal signals from mill to mill. If the window of one of these mills was opened, that meant a rise in prices. The, single, the signal was taken up by the nearby mills and passed on. If the window remained closed, then a fall in prices was indicated. He also talks about the fact that some methods used by various people were to send, I didn't really quite understand this, but to send in the mail stockings and gloves as signs. And if you received the stockings, the prices were up. If you received the gloves, the prices it's down. If you see both stable, I don't know, something like that, right? Anyway, so meanwhile, in the realm of fashion, Benjamin notes in convolute B on fashion, each season brings in its newest creations various secret signals of things to come. Whoever understands how to read these semaphores would know in advance not only about new currents in the arts, but also about new legal codes, wars, and revolutions. So fashion is the kind of ultimate signal of the future, is what Benjamin says. OK, so that's one, one way. Um, but I want to kind of note, uh, take this as an opportunity to think about the question of progress and history, which um, Armin and Victoria um, have proposed as a question problem set, right? So um, how do, where does trends fit on all this? Uh, with the epistemological gift of statistics that I've described, the late, late 19th century gave us a new model of history, the cycle, or what Nietzsche would call the eternal return. Around the same time that statistical thinking then was taking off as a method, and indeed as the notion of the trend began trending upward, the evidence of cycles in fashion, finance, and social systems were increasingly apparent to gatherers of data and facts. Against a linear model of history or that of dialectical progress, the cycle shapes time as rhythmic but never fully predictable patterns. The opening and closing of windows, the receipt, the receipt of stockings or gloves or both in the mail. Indeed, the 19th century was familiar with cycles or something like them. The periodic uh, development of bubbles and crashes, fiscal highs and lows. Beginning with the South Sea bubble of 1720, 
capitalism demonstrated a propensity to follow and dictate simultaneously alternating waves of rallies and crashes. Between 1826 and 1878, there were seven or, fi seven or eight financial crashes with failed banks in London alone. Coming out about, that meant about every once every 10 years like clockwork. Funny, William Stanley Jevons, the writer who developed the mathematical model that turned political economy into economics or was very central in that development. Funny enough, he insisted not long after the 1878 crash that these financial downturns could be perfectly mapped according to solar flares. So you might have heard solar flare theory or something like that. The statistics for each came in perfect alignment, he noted. And so this became, hence, a, a joke within economic circles. But over the next century, economists nevertheless came, came to see, they might have joked about the solar flares, but they nevertheless came to see fiscal crises as natural consequences of the human, cultural, social environment. The economy, having been denaturalized, was renaturalized as a matter of fluxes and flows. Human desires and cultural styles apparently wax and wane according to the moon-like rhythms. Henceforth, history as progress is shown to be a mere trend, forever incomplete, always beginning again. And as Italian philosopher Stef Stefano Marino recently noted, fashion finds its beginning, um, sorry, finds its nourishment in the juxtaposition of two antinomic temporal, di temporal dimensions, namely linear development and circular direction. And with this antinomic origin, the principle of the trend takes precedence. In the place of a linear sequence of different styles envisioned by a historiography of the aesthetic and the artistic, we now have the intertwined play of trends. With this new regime of time, we have a flow that suggests continuity and unpredictability simultaneously. As we see in charts and streetwear alike, photographed here by Hans Eichelboom, um, the form that results from such an aesthetic practice is neither eidos nor morphe. It rather appears as an extemporaneous configuration of the results in a gestaltung that is, by its very nature, metamorphic, serial, incomplete. That was my quote from Stefano Marino. Okay. So, cycles versus trends. Still, um, what he, what I think what Marino kind of just laid out as regarding the trend, I would actually kind of put more in the, the, the domain of the cycle, and I want to differentiate them. It's important to note that they are not the same thing. Although related to the statistical mindset gifted to us by the 19th century and joined through the language of fashion and finance alike, trends and cycles follow different temporal patterns. Or I should say cycles can circumscribe trends, but they can never predict them. And trends can come cyclically, but they don't necessarily. Though fashion cycles, the cyclical return of styles, say mod or grunge, and financial cycles, that is bull and bear runs on the stock exchange, can in retrospect be fairly consistently mapped, like again, clumbing like clockwork, these rhythmic patterns, the trend may or may not have the same consistency. Cycles flux and flow like the long swell of the sea as it follows the moon cycle. The eternal return is guaranteed and expected, even if we're never quite sure where we are amongst the waves. The temporal patterns of trends, by contrast, are less, even less predict predictable. They can spike, hit fever pitch, and then collapse into nothingness all within a month, week, day, or a few hours. Cycles follow a regular beat, a minimalist rhythm, think Steve Reich, trends adopt the frenetic noise of punk, a chaotic beat. Whether they are slow or accelerated as they are now, the movement of cycles remains more or less expected. Trends, by contrast, are tracked with increasingly precise methods of data collection and statistics, and yet we, as mere humans, surf and search trying to catch the wave but always miss. There are too many. The more we seek the trend, the harder and harder it is to locate. As soon as it is named or memed, it begins to lag. We're already bored. On any given day, a trend may, see, may lose steam, leveling off into a regular cycle. Or having lost all of its attractiveness and sticking power, it might return to a semblance of its youthful energy. It comes back as a temporary mnemonic joke. 
So even theory, even theory, theory, like, you know, critical theory, that kind of thing. Even theory, or perhaps especially theory, is subject to trends. Deconstruction and post-structuralism were replaced by post-colonial critique, et cetera, et cetera. At one point or another, searches for Latour surpassed those for Derrida. Bedieu peaks briefly in April 2009, according to this chart, passing Latour. Discussions of globalism, the post-human, the Anthropocene, accelerationism, etc. They all have spikes and then either dwindle, plateau, or crash into oblivion. I note the regularity of modernism and postmodernism, however. These seem to hit brief periodic spikes in April like clockwork, <laughs> corresponding to the end of term university paper writing schedule. In the realm of media theory, I hear from my dear colleague, uh, German media theorist UB at UBC, um, Jeffrey Winthrop Young, the concern is no longer with mediation or cultural techniques. That's old school, so 2015 or something. Now it's time. Everyone is talking about time. And uh, he, I'm, I'm making fun of him, but I, I love I love him anyway. <laughs> anyway, so um, post trend air quality index. Of course, I never seem to have the full story. My searches have me locked in a pretty narrow bubble, a monk-like monastery, which they know I'm a middle-aged white woman. I have a preteen daughter. I like gardening. My favorite sites are WorldCat and Wikipedia. Google Ngrams tells me that people have never cared much about weaving or textiles. They're down at the bottom. And based on my Mozilla um, pocket recommendations or my review of last year's trending searches, God, what the hell was this meme? Apparently this was really important in 2017. I had no idea. I realize I'm always behind the trends. I'm n I'll never catch up. I haven't a clue. So I'm guessing many of you are in the same boat. That's a good thing. Think of it this way, at least we, or maybe just I, didn't bother to bet on bet Bitcoin, especially not when it hit its highest peak sometime last fall at its coolest. It was already post-trend, or rather trending downward, as recent, recent search activity indicates. Schadenfreude. But anyway, one day, maybe sooner that rather than later, uh, I will get the academic game right, this time by focusing on fashion rather than textiles. Uh, but more or less, I'm part of the evened out cycle, a simple co sine, cosine wave pattern, part of the calm, nearly flat waves of the sea of academia. It seems I will never feel that high, except when it's a catastrophe. Okay, so maybe there's a cynicism underlying all of the lecture for today, and I have to admit I was writing this in the midst of a huge depression. I was actually even a bit lightheaded. Um, my delirious cynicism really began to peak last week. The ozone had sunk beneath the stratosphere and was at sea level when I was writing this. It was pushed down under the smoke from the pervasive fires across British Columbia, which you see mapped here uh, in this Google representation of where the fires are across, and Vancouver is down, you know, so you see down, down there, surrounded by fires, right? Um, so I, uh, the ozone was competing for oxygen and I, uh, I felt literally like I couldn't breathe. Indeed, even trending in Canada last week was the Google query for air quality index. For the weather forecast, I began joking to my friends that we might be better off looking at old episodes of the sci-fi TV show The 100, an apocalyptic narrative about a scorched earth future. It had been filmed over the last years, several years in the city and forests around Vancouver, in fact. So this is what the place will look like in years to come, burned and burning. Now, indigenous and settlers alike in Vancouver are living with the hangover of petrochemical colonialism. Canada's exploitation of natural resources, logging, copper mines, and more recently, the tar sands in Alberta, which took over those lands in the 19th and 20th centuries. The Coast Salish First Nations people who have relied on salmon for millennia since time immemorial will no longer have fish within a few decades, maybe less. The resident orca pods um, that were once known as killer whales to the first settlers and killed indiscriminately and are now being fed antibiotics through hoses full of Chinook salmon like human infants, but it's probably too late. Their diet, which has dwindled drastically in recent years, is unsustainable. So they only eat Chinook. These poor orca are very picky eaters. They're like infants. 
I shouldn't say that, but they only eat Chinook salmon, which is a particular kind of salmon, and the spawning for it is not happening up the Fraser River, so it's just devastating. So the J-pod, which is one of the, fa like kind of one of the bigger clusters of families, numbered at 75 in 2005, and it re recently lost its youngest member, J-50, which only lived a few days. We know all of this, this downward trend, because of statistics. And we also know it because of the semaphore. This, here's an orca mama carrying her orca baby around her after it's, her calf, after it had died. It's like so tragic for a week, as though like holding up the flag of, look what you've done. Anyway, Baudrillard's dreams of America were more horrific than he could have even imagined. The territory is not just preceded by the map, but also burns beneath the heat of data servers and smog. Baudrillard woke up from his dream come nightmare of America and realized it was worse. He was living a trend. So, conclusion. Progress or the Jevons paradox. So first noted by William Stanley Jevons, again him, oh, he was very, you know, amazing. Anyway, <laughs> determine this paradox. Uh, it occurs when technological progress increases the efficiency with which a resource is used. But this produces, as modern researchers have confirmed, multiple rebound effects. In addition to reducing the amount needed for a given use, improved efficiency also lowers the relative cost of using a resource, which increases the quantity demanded. That's essentially from Wikipedia. So progress is a technical possibility, perhaps with cloud technology and the like, maybe, but this cloud on the horizon of this big data universe will be, or perhaps already is, indistinguishable from the smog. So we can see progress, at least as a kind of in faith and technology, as always producing its uh, Jevons paradox, the kind of the, the thing that you're trying to avoid. Okay, so on that really, really happy note, I'm going to stop and, and I'm happy to have a discussion if that's even in the time. I, I don't know what went till when we go. So. Uh, we have like 20 minutes or so, but thank you, first of all.